sao in ring shring ka e la ring asang ka hala ring ta ka la ring sao ain kling ring shring Namaste. So, judging from some of the comments we've gotten, and from a conversation I had yesterday with a friend, this thing uh, called transmigration, or the uh, movement of the soul from one body to another body, is not well understood. I mean, anybody who's involved in spiritual life, one of the first things they learn is that this is not the only life. There is another life. Even the Buddha says this. He says, there is a next life. So why is everybody acting as if there isn't? <laughs> in other words, they're focused on the pursuit of short-term goals that apply to this lifetime only. Uh, they want wealth, beauty, power, fame, knowledge, or renunciation, you know, these opulences. But they're all perishable. That's the problem. You can't take it with you, is the common saying. And that's true. So what is this transmigration? What is this process of rebirth? And really, more fundamentally, who or what is it that is reborn? I mean, we throw around the word soul very casually, huh? as if it's just assumed that we know what it is. But can anyone really define it? If you read Bhagavad Gita, there is some discussion on this soul. Krishna says, Na jayate mriyate va kadachin, na yang bhutva bhavita va na bhuya. Ajo nitya shashvato yang purano, na hanyate hanyamane sharire. And that last line, of course, was stolen by Ezra Pound <laughs> and made into part of his poem. If the red slayer thinks he slays, or the slain thinks he is slain, they know not the ways I keep and hold and pass again. Very mysterious, but it becomes quite clear in the Gita. The soul is neither born, nor does it ever die, nor having once been, does it ever cease to be. The soul is without birth, eternal, immortal, and ageless. It is not destroyed when the body is destroyed. But what is this soul? <laughs> it's not described or defined in the Gita. Well, the Gita is designed for a broad audience, mass audience. And although it is very profound, one has to know the background to really understand it. And the background is found in Vedanta. Vedanta and its commentaries, especially the commentary of Shankara, describe the nature of what we call the soul. What is it? Well, the soul is called Atma in Sanskrit. Atma, Jiva Atma, means the soul that is born. And Param Atma means the supreme soul, the soul of the universe, or the soul of all creation, or whatever you want to call it. But even these don't really describe the nature of the soul, which is consciousness. Consciousness plus upadi. Uh, this is Shankara's contribution, his analysis, that when, in what we call the Paramatma, for example, Vishnu, or Devi, or Shiva, or any of the demigods that are immortal, we have Brahman 
plus what we call upadis, or limiting adjuncts, uh, that take this unlimited, pure awareness without any qualities and turns it into an individual. So what's the difference between Jivatma and Paramatma? It's only that in the case of Paramatma, like Vishnu or Devi or Shiva or a few of the other demigods like Agni, Brahma and those, that they know, they are well aware, they are realized and they know that their so-called individuality is only due to upadis. And they can uh, definitely perceive those limitations and if necessary or whenever they like actually, they can go beyond them because they're all Brahman realized. See, any being who becomes Brahman realized can do this. So the aim of self-realization is to attain this realization of Brahman. Realization that I am not limited, I am not an individual, I am not even, what to speak of the body, I'm not even the mind or even consciousness. I'm something beyond that. But in the case of the Jivatma, those who are born, those who have to die, that individuality is hemmed in so tightly by these upadis that for all practical purposes, it's part of them. They are fully conditioned by the upadis, the limitations that make them perceive themselves as an individual, identify with a body, and of course, everything connected with the body. So this is the real nature of soul, right? The soul is nothing but the supreme, the Brahman, huh? the pure awareness, the consciousness, the essence of being. But it is hemmed in by these upadis, by these limitations that make it appear to be something that it's not. Yet, this is the interesting part, <laughs> The nature of Brahman can never be covered over by anything because really there is nothing but Brahman. So the soul is Brahman plus upadis that condition it into this state of an individual, a jiva, one who is born. So what happens when the soul, this soul, this conditioned living entity, uh, is, which is really the supreme living entity, <laughs> but simply highly conditioned. What happens when this body becomes finished? Uh? According to all spiritual philosophy, there are six changes. Gestation, birth, growth, production of byproducts, either work or offspring or both, dwindling and death, right? Everything that exists, everything that has beingness, that existence, uh, has these six changes. And so this is what causes samsara, this constant transmigration from one body to another. And besides that, the specific type of transmigration is controlled by karma. What is karma? Well, karma is our mental and emotional efforts to either resist or chase after certain karmic results. Huh? Actually, everything that happens in our life is foreordained. It's destiny. It's there in the birth chart if you know how to read it. Everything that happens is fate. Everything that happens is going to happen and you can't stop it from happening. Nor can you make something else happen instead. 
because all that was determined by your previous actions in past lives and born along with you in this life, which is why the birth chart is so indicative of what will happen. So, okay, the externals of life are predetermined. And we just, we're just along for the ride. We're just the observer, the passenger in this vehicle of the body. So then how do we generate new karma for the next life? Well, it's our attitude. It's our attitude. If we resist or are greedy for uh, the results of our actions, that is what creates the karma that becomes the next life. And how it works is through uh, vasanas. You see, these thoughts of either resisting what is happening or wanting something else to happen are called desires, right? And desires are suffering. And any thought or perception accompanied by suffering becomes a vasana, it becomes a thought. Hell, some Scientologists call them engrams, right? Any kind of thought or perception accompanied by physical or mental pain or suffering becomes a vasana and is stored in the mind in seed form. We've talked about this before. And then when you encounter a situation that's similar to a stored vasana, it becomes active by process of association in the mind. And then uh, you feel a mental pressure one way or the other either to resist or to want something. So these mental efforts and the vasanas that are created by them and that often uh, will spark them also, these create the karmic seed. And at the end of life, when the whole life is sort of rewound and compressed huh, and formed into a seed, and leaves along with the subtle body when the gross body is finished, that becomes the seed of the next life. So it's very simple. What do you remember at the time of death? You remember all of the actions and attitudes of your, this life. So this is the basis and rationale of sadhana. You know, sadhana, the principles of sadhana are that you get up in the morning and immediately before you do anything else, you remember your mantra. And your mantra is an indication or an aspiration of where you want to go in the next life. The deity that you want to be associated with, and of course that also implies a world where you want to appear. Now, this is all discussed in great detail in Vedanta Sutra and its commentaries. The problem is nobody reads them. <laughs> I started a series on Vedanta Sutra a couple of years back. It got so few views that I just, you know, I just dropped it because <laughs> it wasn't worth the effort. Uh, now I'm starting to get some good comments from Zecho and others. So it, these are very uh, stimulating to me uh, to want to continue these series, but I don't know if I'm ever going to do like a formal series on any scripture again, because they always lead to less views and fewer comments. I don't know what it is. People want to know the conclusions and the attitudes that lead towards liberation, but they don't want to know the, the technical materials that, that show you how. You know, this has always been like a head scratcher for me. You know, everybody wants to hang out with somebody who's enlightened. But when I start talking about how to get enlightened, they lose interest. Duh. Anyway, <laughs> sadhana is the process of reinforcing a certain type of vasana. Huh? Because sadhana always involves some kind of austerity. Okay, austerity means conscious or deliberate suffering. 
Like, I'm going to chant so many rounds of my mantra before breakfast. Huh? I'm going to put off my breakfast to do my sadhana. So there's a little bit of suffering. Or one observes principles like truthfulness, non-stealing, or uh, non-violence, physical and emotional non-violence, verbal non-violence. Uh, these are all troublesome to some degree because the body has a natural uh, programming to want to defend itself. So out of fear, we commit violence, uh, you know, to other living entities like uh, cows and other animals for food, or we uh, make remarks that are calculated to induce pain in others. Um, th these things have to be given up to become a real sadhu. So how do we do that? Well, we have to make a mental effort, right? We have to counteract the vasanas from past lives or previous karma that push us in the direction of these violent acts. And we have to stop them uh, before they become more than just a thought or more than just an impulse, before they become words or action. So this is an austerity. This is painful. This is difficult. It's an effort. And effort is ego. And ego is the sum total of all the vasanas, who I am. Okay, so when we uh, make efforts to counteract the vasanas, we create karma. And that karma draws us towards a future destination in our next life. You see how this all works? It's a machine, but it's a machine that if we know how it works, we can take control of, or at least we can influence it in the direction that we want. We don't want to be reborn on this earth planet, you know? What to speak of being reborn in an animal body or something like that. But what are the things that people think of all the time? Sex, food, uh, winning, you know, beating the other guy winning over your opponents and stuff like this. This is the kind of thoughts that people have. So at the end of their life, when they're about to leave the body and the mind is rewound and compressed, it becomes a seed. And what is it full of? All those qualities of those thoughts they had their whole life. And this only leads to rebirth as a human being or lower. But if for our whole life or as much of our life as we have uh, time, if we uh, cre consciously create thoughts of higher quality, higher vibration, higher energy, see, then the cumulative effect of those thoughts at the end of life will take us higher. And of course, the ultimate thing is to attain complete self-realization and be beyond all this stuff completely. Huh? But this is very rare. But even if one attains self-realization, then, as we've been over in earlier videos here, one does not have to simply disappear and merge with Brahman. There is a possibility to become an eternal individual in cooperation and identity, one with God, yet at the same time, have one's own separate form and identity and sphere of activities and so on. And this is a very elaborate subject. We have gotten a little bit into it uh, some time back. There was a series on Rasa Tattva, which I'm going to put a link to here. And uh, that's a very deep, very elaborate subject. But it is how we determine our preference for the next life, what we would like to become. And of course, we put a lot of energy, especially early in this uh, channel, on the process of becoming Paticca Samupada. And that's another series that you should watch on Paticca Samupada, because it shows you how actually to become whatever you want to become. If you want to become something better, greater, more intelligent and, and happier, than you are now, then you have to follow this path of sadhana.
Aung Tat Sat. Aung Shakti Aung.